全面加强练兵备战。Could our nation's biggest geopolitical rival take down our power grid? Could it be possible that we are helping them do it? I know what you're thinking. What do big white wind generators have to do with China? The answer is bigger and worse than I ever imagined. On February 14, 2021, cold weather, snow, and ice made its way to Central Texas and triggered winter weather advisories. The concern right now are these rolling outages, these periodic blackouts. Dozens of deaths have been attributed to the storm. The total death count is now 246 deaths. Four minutes and 37 seconds. That's how close Texas was from a total power grid collapse. I wish the consumer would dictate what they want because I think consumers would choose reliable power sources instead of what we have. Texans are demanding someone be held accountable. Who's to blame? The way that ERCOT has handled this entire situation has been completely unacceptable. February 2021, Texans will never forget. Sure, it's easy to think the biggest threats to Texas's electric grid are a winter storm or an extended heat wave. And yes, those might be the proximate causes of the grid's collapse. But February freezes and August heat are nothing new. What's new is the weakness that's been purpose built into the state's power grid. It's a weakness we've been conditioned to accept as the new normal. As the summer temperatures rise, Texans find themselves wondering if they can trust the power will be there when they get home from work. Will the AC come on? Will the lights work? More than half of Texas voters now think the grid is unreliable. They're actually expecting it to fail. And they're right to be concerned. So today, a Chinese general still plugs directly into ERCOT this very day. I think that's a bad idea. I think that's a risk. How did Texas end up in this position? We didn't run out of energy. We're just running out of freedom. All of this is about control. This is just not a good idea. It makes no sense for Texas. It makes no sense for the United States. Tear Texas down because you bring Texas down and the rest of the nation goes with it. And if it fails, it will be because we walked blindly down this path, outsourcing our independence to our nation's sworn enemies. It is a national security issue. They've embedded themselves in our infrastructure. The, the Chinese government might be evil, but they're not stupid. Everybody needs to start connecting the dots. Green energy is driving China's red power, and you're paying for it. In the 5th century BC, the Chinese military philosopher Sun Tzu wrote what remains the most influential treaty on strategies and tactics, the art of war. In his section titled Weaknesses and Strengths, he makes a very straightforward observation. If the enemy is at rest in comfortable quarters, harass him. If he is living in plenty, cut off his supplies. If sitting ready for attack, cause him to move. America's military strength has rested on our self-sufficiency. We could not be cut off and starved out of Fortress America. We couldn't be cut off from water. We didn't have to move. Yet the reckless policies of the late 20th century have revealed the United States to be dependent on foreign sources for the most important supply line of all, energy.
Benjamin Franklin didn't invent electricity, but he did popularize the understanding that it could be harnessed. The 20th century showed the remarkable advances in human flourishing that can arise through cheap, abundant, and reliable energy, most notably in the United States, but also around the world. True poverty has all but been crushed wherever there's cheap, abundant, and reliable energy. From the Reagan administration through the Trump administration, energy independence became a rallying cry for all who would pay attention. Our goal was and remains increased energy independence for America. First, today's Energy Independence Action calls for an immediate reevaluation of the so called Clean Power Plan. By 2019, the United States had finally achieved a form of energy independence. We were exporting more than we were importing. It was short lived and, as it turns out, perhaps even somewhat illusionary. Ironically, by striving for energy independence, we allowed ourselves to be pushed into dependence and down the path towards poverty. We've done so because we forgot one of the earliest lessons from the art of war. All warfare is based on deception. The Marxist left has gone from merely talking about crushing capitalism to worshiping the environment. In man's arrogance, we've chosen to embrace the pagan mythology that Mother Earth and Father Son can provide all our needs. It's all been a lie. In Texas, in California, and around the nation, we are crashing headlong into a soul-crushing form of cultural and economic poverty for the illusion of green energy. We're in a full-on crisis. We're told we have to abolish the sources of greenhouse gases, or GHGs, and the only way to save the world is to shackle ourselves to unreliable power sources. Standing ready to help us along this path has been China, offering to sell us inefficient, unreliable, and expensive means of energy production the profits from which China is meanwhile using to supercharge its own energy systems with reliable, efficient, and inexpensive systems that politicians in Austin and Washington have forced us to ditch. Those solar panels and windmills hogging out resources and jacking up your electric bill seem green. They're giving power, not to your home, but to a nation that has sworn itself to the mission of destroying America. To understand where America is being taken, we first have to understand where we've been. No one's done more to explore and celebrate the rise of human prosperity and flourishing than philosopher Alex Epstein. Alex founded the Center for Industrial Progress based in Laguna Beach, California, where I caught up with him recently. He's an avowed critic of the push for so-called net zero carbon policies that are used to justify attacks on reliable energy production and therefore used to push for wind and solar. You're either evaluating the Earth on a pro-human standard like human flourishing or an anti-human standard. In some ways, it feels like the opponents of fossil fuels. It's not so much that they hate fossil fuels, but they hate the independence and the prosperity that fossil fuels bring. Yeah, now let's put it in the context of a term that the anti-fossil fuel people like to use, which is the livable planet. Right, so say, we're, the reason we're opposing fossil fuels is because we want a livable planet for our children and grandchildren, uh, et cetera. Now, what is a livable planet? Well, livable planet is a planet in which the organisms you care about can flourish, which means live long lives, healthy lives. And, and if you look at the planet from the perspective of livability, what you see historically is it was not a very livable place. So even as recently as 200 years ago, but going back thousands and thousands and thousands of years, life expectancy was sub 30 years. So people were just poor. And the population was very small. So we had an earth that could support a very small population, very short lives, very low standard of living, including very low opportunity. And then suddenly 200 years ago, it went from this sort of flat stagnation, right? To just jumping up to this incredible level of flourishing. It's the same planet, right? Same rock, 
same atmosphere. I mean, we've changed the atmosphere a little bit. And they said, well, we changed the atmosphere. It must have made it unlivable. But whatever has happened in the atmosphere, the planet has become incredibly livable, right? Because now we have 8 billion people who live to, you know, around 70 on average and um, have stratospherically high income compared to the past. And everyone should be interested in what caused this. For Epstein, the answer is found in harnessing reliable energy to power machines that have allowed humanity to flourish. The experts promoting so-called green energy don't like that. In particular, they have this idea that human impact can only ruin the Earth, when in fact human impact can actually make the Earth much better. But then also it points to, if they don't acknowledge the positive impact so far, maybe they have a different definition of positive and negative than I do. I think of positive and negative in terms of the Earth as the Earth is more conducive to human flourishing. I think their view of positive with regard to the Earth is that it has less human impact on it. So their view of the ideal Earth is the Earth that has little or no human impact. You're either evaluating the Earth on a pro-human standard, like human flourishing, or an anti-human standard. What you see really is this general, incredibly negative attitude toward human impact on Earth. And what you notice is, it, we were talking about the increase in human flourishing on Earth. From, from one perspective, what that means is human impact on Earth has been overwhelmingly positive, right? We've taken a planet that's very impoverished and dangerous and made it unnaturally abundant and safe. Let's assume Alex Epstein is right about the anti-human agenda of the environmental movement, and he makes a strong case for it. But whether that agenda is real or not, the left-wing proponents of the extremist environmentalist movement have found willing allies in the halls of power. It's not a stretch to say that politicians have been gripped by what Texas Republican Chip Roy calls climate hysteria. And the Democrat Party has, of course, embraced that hook, line, and sinker. And with that has come the massive number of subsidies, the entire uh, kind of uh, reconfiguration of everything about our way of life in this country, um, in my opinion, to the detriment. And that those subsidies are, are absolutely killing um, our ability to, to prosper by driving prices up, by making it difficult to go get you know, oil and gas exploration. That climate hysteria has captured a generation or two or three of Americans because of our broken education system. It has totally corrupted and bankrupted the Democratic Party. They're completely devoid of anything remotely sensible when it comes to energy production, including nuclear, by the way, ironically. Um, but it's unfortunately captured a large chunk of Republicans. And it turns out the Lone Star State has not been immune to the climate hysterics. In fact, it's led the nation in being held captive by unreliable power generation. Texas is one of three grids. There's the Eastern grid, there's a Western grid, and then Texas has its own electric grid. We were doing real fine, real good, until the federal government stepped in and they started with, uh, with the environmental issues that started nipping away at our power system. State Senator Bob Hall is an expert in energy systems. He studied electrical engineering at the Citadel and served in the U.S. Air Force, where he led a project focused on hardening electronics from disruption by enemy forces. That focus has translated into a passion for protecting Texas's grid. We're just operating right on the hairy edge of rolling brownouts, rolling blackouts. Why? Because of government handouts and subsidies to big corporations. The issue of subsidies is at the heart of the problem facing Texas. Bill Peacock is one of the state's foremost experts on energy policy. He recently calculated that more than $30 billion have been spent in Texas subsidizing so-called renewable energy projects. The reason they've had to do that is because these technologies are not cost competitive. It, it costs them so much more to generate electricity than it does from traditional thermal sources like natural gas that they couldn't have survived without these subsidies. Let's quickly define four terms. You've already heard some of them, and they're important to understand. Thermal energy. That's power derived from heating water to turn a turbine. The heat has come generally from coal, natural gas, oil, and nuclear sources. 
natural gas and coal have been the go-to sources in Texas. This power is often called dispatchable power. That means that when it's needed, it can be delivered onto the grid. It's very reliable. In contrast, you have intermittent power. This is power that no matter the intentions of the operator, it's limited in when it can operate. This kind of power comes from what's been called renewable sources, solar and wind. As more and more of the Texas electric grid is based on intermittent power, the less reliable it's become. Lastly, you'll hear the name ERCOT. That's the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. It's a quasi-governmental agency that oversees 90% of the Texas electric grid. All of this can start to feel really confusing and really complicated really fast. That seems to be intentional. The electric grid hasn't been this complicated forever. It used to be we built some natural gas plants and coal plants and nuclear plants. And then the only variable was, was how hot or cold it was gonna be every day. But with the onslaught of wind and solar into the things, all these different variables come into play. You can't ever count on wind or solar being there because you, you just don't know from day to day whether they're gonna show up. The myth is that wind and solar are cheap and abundant. Well, abundant is a very ambiguous term because there's a question of the abundant, uh, like the physical abundance of something. And is it abundant or scalable as an actual usable resource? So if something is expensive, it's not abundant in terms of a resource. So if we just focus on the issue of cost, uh, the myth is that they're cheap. And this is done using a lot of really shameful accounting tricks. But the, the fundamental one is not factoring in the cost of reliability. I mean, but like, let's say saying I have a, I have a car. And I'm not factoring the cost reliability and the, co the car only works a third of the time and you don't know when it's going to work. That's not the same thing. So you're comparing apples to rotten oranges. One third of the Texas grid has a catastrophic failure every day at 6 p.m. That's not a good idea. Yeah. It's a terrible idea, in my opinion. Kyle Bass is a Dallas-based businessman. He's pointing to the inherent problem with solar energy. It literally only works when the sun is shining. And they say, well, battery technology is coming. And, you know, the state of Texas has had five gigawatts of, of battery uh, put in um, so far. We think we're going to have 10 gigawatts by the end of this year. Um, it's, a big, it's a big deal. But those batteries run at, at best two hours a day. It's no great achievement to create a whole bunch of unreliable electricity because you either need some unimaginably large uh, battery backup and overbuilding of them. So you can just have, you know, weeks of the stuff on hand, which is just catastrophically expensive. You cannot build enough battery backup for them. It's impossible. Batteries, catastrophic failures. I needed someone to help me sort out the state's energy systems. I turned to my friend, Luke Dunn. He runs the operations for Crown Quest, which is an oil and gas company, but they buy a lot of electricity. So he's had to learn how the system works. Setting aside cloudy days for a second, solar power fails very predictably at sunset, as Kyle Bass said. But how about wind? It only blows about 25% of the time. Luke Dunn explained the battery problem for me using a megawatt. That's the energy that ERCOT says is needed to power about 250 homes during peak hours. If you took a one megawatt example, which if you did that with natural gas, coal, or nuclear, you could have constant running power on that and say, anytime I needed, I could go up to one megawatt or down. If you wanted to do that same amount of power to provide that with wind or solar, let's use wind as an example, wind only blows sometime between 15% and 30% of the time. So it's only running during that time. So roughly 25% of the time. So at a minimum, you would need four megawatts of wind to be built. But on top of that, you would also have to have battery backups to be able to hold that power for a 24 hour period. And so to have enough battery backup for that, if that one megawatt of wind can run a quarter of the time, that's gonna be about five hours a day, maybe six hours a day. So you need 18 or 19 megawatts of backup 
battery power because one megawatt battery can run one hour of power. So we can build one, one megawatt natural gas power plant or roughly four megawatts of wind power plus 18 or 19 megawatts of battery backup. All of that to ensure one megawatt of power is available. The unreliability and inefficiency go hand in hand. When people think of wind and solar, they have this fantasy that it's just the sunlight and the wind gusts and that's it. But one of my points is you need to look at the whole process. And if you look at the whole process, you can see it's very materially intensive. It's very land intensive. Okay, so this might be a good place to talk briefly about the amount of space these intermittent power generators take up. A study by Utah State University's Strata Group examined how much land it takes to produce a megawatt of power. All in, coal, natural gas, and nuclear all require about 12 acres of land each when producing a megawatt of power. That includes the footprint for drilling and mining. For wind and solar, producing that same megawatt requires a lot more land. For solar, 43 and a half acres. And for wind, just over 70 acres. And none of that includes the excess Luke Dunn described that's needed to keep that megawatt always available the way it is for the reliables. The sheer amount of space needed to produce even a little electricity from wind explains in part why the Biden administration had been trying to give away a massive section of the Gulf of Mexico right off the coast of Galveston. I went down to the coast to check it out and set up a call with the woman who led the charge against the Biden plan. That would be Texas Land Commissioner Dawn Buckingham. When we set up this call, I, I didn't know we'd have a tropical storm uh, hitting here in the Galveston. So, uh, so thanks for doing this today. We're so happy to be on with you today, Michael. You have been leading the charge to stop the Biden administration from placing uh, these massive wind generators off the coast of Galveston, right behind me. Uh, why is this fight so important to you, Commissioner? There are a lot of reasons to fight this project tooth and nail, as it is so critical to Texas, and not just our grid, but our wonderful environment and the safety of our oceans. The fact that these blades become projectiles in a hurricane, potentially, there's not a single fan that has survived a hurricane. There are a lot of reasons to fight this project tooth and nail. Commissioner Buckingham's family was in Galveston when the deadly hurricane of 1900 struck. I have the desk that was in the second story of their house when that storm surge hit and washed that desk down the stairs. So imagine a fan blade coming on a big storm surge, coming through the second story of a house and acting like a skewer through the entire house causing damage. There's just a lot of good solid reasons to uh, fight against these wind farms and to just spread the truth and speak the truth about how detrimental they actually are to the environment. The Vineyard Wind Project is shut down until further notice. They're trying to figure out what caused Vineyard Wind 1, one of their turbines, to break, sending shards of sharp fiberglass washing up onto beaches. So I, I was really, uh, really struck in your letter to the Biden administration. You noted that each one of these uh, generators uh, contains 335 tons of steel, 4.7 tons of copper, two tons of rare earth minerals, 1,200 tons of concrete, and 1,400 liters of oil. Um, at a time when we've got the environmentalists telling us we can't drill out in the ocean, but they're sticking a lot of really environmentally nasty um, items out there. Um, do, does the presence of windmills seem to kind of undermine their case? Well, you know, I tell you what, it shows their absolute hypocrisy where they say they want one thing, but then they do the complete opposite and advocate for something based on a political talking point and to, instead of what is actually better for power generation as well as our environment. So we've laid down the law. We've told them those transmission lines are never getting a permit across state land. You know, since Texas was a sovereign nation, we control three marine leagues, roughly 10.3 miles out to the Gulf. Most of the other states only have a couple miles. It's not a reliable energy source. It has a lot of issues. It doesn't necessarily meet Texas needs. This is just not a good idea. It makes no sense for Texas. It makes no sense for the United States. 
As of July, the Biden administration has pushed pause on pursuing this project. Is there a place for wind and solar and and even large scale batteries? There are great applications of where solar panels make a lot of sense. I have a gate that I use for a solar panel that would have cost a fortune to get hooked up to the, the grid and, and having the option to use a solar panel for that small battery to operate that grate is fantastic. Uh, I'm not so sure that large scale power generation is a good application. Uh, and, and if people can make that a good op application and compete on a, on a level in a market, I'm great for that. I just don't wanna pay to subsidize it. You know what I'd like to have in terms of solar in mind? Independence. I don't want to be on the grid if I don't have to be. If you don't have full energy freedom, okay, you don't have the uh, engine of economic prosperity and growth. You just don't. Um, abundant, reliable energy is the lifeblood for the engine of commerce that allows human beings to profit and prosper. They're not offering a superior technology uh, for customers to voluntarily choose they're offering a wildly inferior technology to force customers to use and prevent us from using what works. Environmental concerns and economic concerns abound about the impact of intermittent energy sources, these so-called renewables. The federal government is, is controlled by the folks who want to push the false narrative of the renewables being environmental friendly. Uh, they aren't, they aren't in any way at all. One of the misconceptions about renewable energy is that it's actually renewable, but windmills windmills fail and they have to be replaced and, and solar panels don't last forever. They actually have shorter, both wind turbines and, and solar panels have generally have shorter lifespans than even natural gas generators would have. The waste from the windmills alone staggers the imagination. Across from the city cemetery in Sweetwater, Texas is a different kind of graveyard one dedicated to the remains of windmills. This is the environmentally responsible way to dispose of windmills, apparently. I tried to visit the facility, but found the doors and gates locked. The building and parking lot were overgrown with weeds, evidence that no one was actively dealing with the almost incalculable amount of waste from these so-called environmentally friendly energy producers. Since the facility had clearly been abandoned, I decided to check it out. They're apparently not real interested in anyone videotaping or photographing their facility. It makes you wonder what they're hiding. I think I'm gonna go walk around and take a look at uh, these windmill parts. We're told that we're supposed to fall for green energy because it's so clean and so good for the environment. But here I am standing on a pile of windmill waste that goes on and on and on and on. You can't recycle the blades. They imply through their propaganda, meeting the wind companies in that industry, that they're a recyclable green company. They're not. There's very little of that structure that's gonna get recycled. Jeff Tucker retired from being a Fort Worth firefighter to Brown County, where as a conservationist and hunter, he looked forward to enjoying life in the country. He found himself instead in the middle of a fight to stop the onslaught of wind turbines. Uh, you can go out and see the desert where they're burying the blades in the sand because they can't deconstruct it. So is that green? Is that renewable? State Center Lois Cole course of Brenham has those same questions. What does happen? with all of the wind turbines that are no longer used. What happens to a hailstorm that comes through and destroys 
solar panels and there's leakage of those chemicals into our water supplies. We, we need to be asking those questions. Well, if you talk to the solar industry, we shouldn't be concerned about environmental waste at all. They, they guarantee us that it's all in good shape and there's no problems. And But then you go look at one of these uh, solar farms in, in Texas that recently uh, got, got hit by a hailstorm. And they're just pieces of solar panels all over the place. Nobody really quite understands w what is involved in that and and you know, what kind of metals are involved and, and strange kind of uh, chemical compounds and, and what that's going to do to the environment. None of that is theoretical. In the spring of 2024, a storm moved through the counties around Houston, bringing hail and flooding. In other words, a typical spring. A massive solar field in Brazoria and Fort Bend counties was hit by hail, destroying hundreds of acres of solar panels. Months later, we were there and found none of those ruined solar panels had been cleaned up. Weeds were starting to grow up around them. We were made aware late last week of a potential wind farm in Fayette County. It, by the media reports, is going to be 20,000. They're looking to lease 20,000 acres between LaGrange and Schulenburg. I know this area really well. I've grown up here. Beautiful, beautiful area. The proposal is on, supposedly reported, 600-foot wind turbines on 20,000 acres in Fayette County, which none of us would think that Fayette County would be a wind source. It's not really West Texas. It's not really the coast. And so um, that's why they have to be 600 feet. For perspective, the Statue of Liberty is 305 feet from the bottom of the pedestal to the top of the torch. The Washington Monument stands at 555 feet, and the San Jacinto Monument is 567 feet. We actually started to do research on the individuals that work for the wind companies, and it was amazing how little wind turbines we found in their land, in their areas, right, where they live. And yet, they were pushing it in our backyard. You just follow the money. Or you follow the taxpayer money, right? To use Chip Roy's phrase, climate hysteria. Well, it bears only part of the blame for the proliferation of windmills and solar panels onto the Texas and national grids. The real driver, of course, is money. Clean oh. Got it. Got it. If it weren't for renewable energy subsidies, there wouldn't be a single wind turbine in Texas. There wouldn't be a single solar panel. They, they are so uneconomical, so uncompetitive when it comes to low cost natural gas, coal, those types of things that they just wouldn't be here. And it, it, so it's amazing to think that, that now we're getting on an average basis, probably 30% of our uh, electricity from those sources. They wouldn't even exist if it weren't for the subsidies. So you take California where we are right now, it's not simply that they forced us to pay a bunch of money for solar and wind, particularly solar. It's that they actually shut down, you know, major nuclear power plant near here, San Onofre. They actually shut down natural gas plants. They're actually starting to shut down our ability to import reliable fossil fuel electricity from other places. So that's the subsidies and the shackles are just incredibly, it's just an incredibly dangerous combination because you end up not only paying more, but you have way less of it. So you're paying more for what you're being asked to take less of. The costs just keep climbing. It has cost Texas taxpayers and consumers billions and billions of dollars. We pay for it two different ways, either through higher electricity prices or higher taxes. Texas subsidies for intermittent, unreliable energy sources began in 2001. Few people have been fighting against those harder than lowest coal cost. In preparing for this interview, I will just tell you that I went back and did a deep dive on the number of bills that I filed. And you know what I found? Every bill that I filed since 2009, all the way up to last session, over and over and over again, if you'll do a T-list search, left pending in committee, left pending in committee. I had one get to general state calendar, died on general state calendar. And so I think that that accentuates and it emphasizes how strong the lobby has been in, in wind and solar uh, field and you know congratulations to them they're hired to do that and they've done a really good bit, job of killing 
what I think were common sense bills uh, to, to, to again rein in some of the richness that were given in the subsidies, which eventually led to this unbalanced portfolio. Basically, unreliable electricity is equated with reliable electricity. And again, that's like equating rotten oranges with apples. You need a way where you're actually valuing reliability. An unbalanced energy portfolio makes the electrical grid unstable. Between a quarter and half of the electric grid capacity in Texas is now at the mercy of the wind and sunshine. So it begs the question, who are we subsidizing exactly? Sure, people investing in these government-manipulated markets are making a killing, but they aren't the only ones. But I think we've got somewhere in the order of actually $100 billion worth of subsidies every year that are going out right now under the so-called Inflation Reduction Act. Most of it going to corporations, right? Some of it goes to individuals, but almost all of it is going to corporations to subsidize the, the solar and subsidize the wind. And then a lot of that's going to China for obvious reasons. So what are those obvious reasons? More than 80% of solar panels are made in China, and depending on who you talk to, between 30 and 70% of wind turbines are made in China. So it bears asking, what's China doing for electricity? China has about 1,100 coal-fired plants. We have about 250. They're building about one and a half to two a week. We're building nine. They're building new nuclear power plants. We're building nine. What are we doing? We're piling it into wind and solar which is obliterating the landscape of America with massive subsidies for inefficient, unreliable energy that's destroying the reliability of the grid, driving up the price of energy, and creating massive amounts of waste that you've got to go bury out in America when these windmills uh, you know, break down, or by the way, when they freeze as they did a couple of years ago in Texas. Okay, so I, I want to step back for a second. Sure. Something you just said shocked me. China's building one and a half coal-fired plants a week. China is doing that, I would imagine, yeah. in some part, with the cash we're sending them to build us solar panels. If solar panels are such a good idea, why isn't China using solar to rev up their economy? They're no dummy. They got to build their economy up and grow their economy. So they are producing reliable power. And so they're using coal predominantly heavily to do it. They're doing some gas, but it's really heavily coal. And they've got some nuclear power they're building as well. But it, it's reliable power that's trying to generate that, that production. So while China is building a new coal plant every three days to what, two weeks, we're actually going backwards in America with reliability. Who thinks that's a good idea? I bet China thinks it's a good idea. Everybody needs to start connecting the dots. There are many problems with China and energy. I mean, the fundamental one is that we are choosing inferior energy. That's the number one thing, because if you have inferior energy, you have an inferior economy, which ultimately means an inferior military, which means a jeopardized country. Now, on top of that, we're choosing inferior energy that is sourced from arguably our greatest geopolitical threat, which is China. So one of the justifications is we don't want to be so dependent on the Middle East, but our dependence on the Middle East is trivial for oil compared to our dependence on China for the whole solar and wind supply chain. So even if they were actually reliable and cost effective, there would be concerns about where they're coming from. But to make yourself dependent on something inferior is insane. If you think American politicians have yielded too much to China's agenda, American businesses are even worse. The U.S. business, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they fall all over themselves because corporations have investments in China that you mentioned, right? Wall Street has investments in China. Corporations have PP&E, property plant and equipment in China. And every one of those corporations gives to the American Chamber of Commerce and lobbies to keep the doors open so that they can make more money, pick up another dime in front of this bulldozer. I always say here at our firm, if US national security were left to the private sector, we'd all be speaking Chinese tomorrow. We're taking um, productive land out of production, relying on um, China to send us solar panels and wind turbines, because that's the only thing that we have on our grid now. We're no longer a superpower. How concerned should 
you know, the average Texan be, uh, that the Western world is dumping billions of dollars into China's economy, specifically for wind and solar projects here in the States that are unreliable. No one's ever asked me this question directly like that. Um, and I think it's vital to understand, first of all, why China wants alternative energy to become real. If you, if you think about in a hydrocarbon-based world like we were in pre, call it alternative energy revolution, um, China was a net buyer of everything, right? Today, China imports 12 million barrels of crude every day, eight and a half BCF of LNG every day, uh, and 40% of their food every single day. And they have to pay dollars for all of that. Imagine if they could all of a sudden become the world's go-to energy source. Heretofore, they had not been an energy source. They had been an energy buyer. Our reliance on them for wind and solar puts them in a very important position on the global stage. So China helped us get hooked on expensive, inefficient energy sources that they produce so that we'll give them money that they can use to buy food and control our power grid. The Chinese government might be evil, but they're not stupid. We're playing right along with them, the current administration is. We're not gonna get a change in any of these policies until we get a change at the federal level. When you talk about electric power, it is a national security issue. It is probably one of our most important assets. The reliance on China just makes it infinitely worse. Because when you think about the components within the windmills or the solar panels, in the solar panels, there are computer chips, right? If someone wants to inhibit the flow, they can actually do it if they can get to those chips. Well, who do you think is providing those chips for the solar panel? The bad guys. Of course, China isn't just relying on computer chips and wind turbines and solar panels to use green energy as a way to wage a not so subtle war on the United States. So today, a Chinese general still plugs directly into ERCOT to this very day. Uh, I think that's a bad idea. I think that's a risk. I think we should have laws against that. You've got China coming in and they're buying land in Texas to build winds. Uh, and they're buying them near military installations. Yeah, that's an issue. A Chinese Red Army general bought land adjacent to Laughlin Air Force Base, a key training facility located east of Del Rio. He immediately began putting wind turbines on the land closest to the air base. Today at the state capitol, top leaders raised concerns about farmland and tech companies that are owned by companies associated with the Chinese government. Let's be clear, this has not been an isolated incident limited only to Texas. Individuals connected to the CCP and the Red Army are buying up land near military installations nationwide. China purchasing a lot of American farmland, including some around U.S. military bases, buying more than 50,000 acres of land, sometimes paying five times the market value. A Chinese food manufacturer purchased more than 300 acres of land just 20 miles from Grand Forks Air Force Base, which is home to some of the nation's most sensitive military drone technology. Not just uh, agricultural land, but frankly, in some cases, completely useless land, except for the fact that it's right outside major mili military installations. And not just in North Dakota, but also in Texas, also near an Air Force base. Kyle Bass was among the first to raise concerns about these purchases in a technology called over-the-horizon mapping. Typical windmills are in the 300-foot, 340-foot range, the new applications from the Chinese general where they wanted to build 700 foot tall windmill. Imagine a windmill that tall. And the higher it is, the more horizon it can map, right? And now over the horizon mapping can be accurate within one square inch. Well, that's important, right? We shouldn't allow those kinds of things. These are like national security 101. That's our number one Air Force training base there. We do things there that are both unclassified and classified, it's a very important base for us. All of this, the high prices, the weakening of our economy, the weakening of our national security, the Chinese infiltration, this is all happening in the name of responding to the climate hysteria. But that's not all it is. Our politicians are introducing European-style energy poverty right here in the United States. 
we need to be brought down to live at a poverty level with the rest of the world. There are those who have this world vision that the whole world should live evenly at a very low standard. The experts on the radical left are very open about this. Jason Hinkle is an economic anthropologist. He's a proponent of what he calls degrowth. It's what it sounds like. Basically, rich nations need to actively scale down less necessary forms of production. Okay. And that's what we refer to as degrowth, right? So instead of assuming that every sector of the economy should grow all the time, regardless of whether or not we actually need it to, let's have a conversation about what sectors we actually need to improve, things like healthcare access, uh, public transportation, et cetera, et cetera, and what sectors are clearly destructive and socially unnecessary and should be scaled down. So, you know, SUV production, private car production, um, you know, arms production, fast fashion. Uh, advertising, planned obsolescence, et cetera, et cetera. There are huge sectors of our economy which are totally irrelevant to human well-being. And we can actively scale those down without any loss to our ability to satisfy core needs and achieve flourishing lives for all. Joseph Aldi is a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School. Here's his solution. So if you emit carbon dioxide, or in some cases, if you are an energy company that brings a fossil fuel to the market, that when it's burned emits carbon dioxide, you'll be taxed based on the carbon content of that fuel. And we've seen those policies in effect dating back to the early 1990s and much of Northern Europe. Remember what Alex Epstein called the anti-human agenda? It's worth noting that human beings exhale almost 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide annually. <laughs> and Speaking of the example of Northern Europe, the nation of Denmark announced in June 2024 that they would begin taxing cow farts. Yes, seriously. I believe they want control. I believe they believe in managed economies. They believe in telling you what you can and can't do. You know, arms production, there are huge sectors of our economy which are totally irrelevant to human well-being. That's what this is all about. They get to decide. They get to tell you what you can do, where you can go, how long you can be there, what you can shop, what you can buy. Can you drive that battery-powered car with a kill switch to go buy a gun? In a follow-up conversation, Luke Dunn laid out the plan he sees that's been taken with the American people. It's what he describes as a four-step process for controlling people through programmed energy poverty. It goes like this. First, subsidize unreliable energy. That becomes a carrot. Second, make reliable energy unaffordable through regulations. That turns the carrot into a stick. Third, begin mandating efficiency standards. Yes, this makes everything you buy more expensive, but it also makes things more controllable. And fourth, take charge. So where in these four steps do you think we are? And as you consider that, think about proposals for kill switches in cars and smart meters on homes and offices. It seems that scarcity is a feature rather than a bug for the proponents of wind and solar. Yes, I agree with this entirely, and I've I've always agreed with this, and I've argued it since the beginning beginning of my career. But it's it's now becoming very apparent, because what they said at the beginning was, use our energy and you'll be rich, and we're going to have way more energy. And then what happens is, well, the way more energy doesn't happen. It's the opposite. Energy becomes more scarce, more expensive, less reliable. They say, well, maybe you can deal with a little bit less energy. And then you start to see they do these trial balloons, like, well, maybe you don't need to eat meat and maybe you can eat bugs and maybe you can live in a really small space. And, and it's it's trending toward maybe you can die. We're, we're creating our own dystopian future. Yes, and it's really, it's just, be, it's all preventable. It's all bad ideas. Again, we didn't run out of energy. They used to be afraid of running out of energy. We're just running out of freedom. This is all really bad news, isn't it? I know it can be pretty depressing. The throttling of the American economy, undermining our national defense, eroding our individual liberties. It feels like there's no hope, right? All of this can be stopped. As with all things, fixing a problem starts with recognizing it. Winter Storm Uri was an early alarm for Texans. 
Will we keep snoozing? Because the economics for intermittent, unreliable energy generators only works with subsidies. The key is the subsidies. Take away the subsidies and things will balance out. What seems to work is, is people getting together and first of all, talking to their local politicians. Because basically, if they don't get the subsidies or renewable energy facilities, wind farm, solar farms won't show up. And so if you can keep your county commissioners or school boards from giving them subsidies, they usually don't show up. This is what Jeff Tucker experienced. He and his neighbors successfully stopped wind turbines. How? Well, by working with those neighbors in Brown County. Uh, it's kind of a pincer movement. Several of us would all do several things at one time. Go talk to the mayor. You're going to talk to the commissioners. I'll go down and talk to our state representatives. We'll also call our senators and Congress people. I mean, we were doing all of that uh, immediately in tandem with each other. But we started locally and then went to the commissioners, then went to municipalities, went to the council people in Brownwood. One thing citizens can do is at the county level, at the school district level, insist that they stop subsidies, no tax abatements for unreliable energy. Contact your state representative, contact your state senator. Also talk to your county judge because county judges and commissioner's courts can give chapter 312 agreements to wind and solar, what is translated to tax abatements. We have got to make sure that we've got reliable power in Texas. The only way to win it in DC is to win it in the states that frankly are too often, you know, all hat, no cattle, right? Texas isn't as strong as Texans like to say it is. And that's, that's unfortunate. One thing I would say for Texans in particular, this applies to all Americans, but Texans in particular, is don't lose your outrage over how abominable the energy and in particular the electricity situation is. It is outrageous that so long after Thomas Edison gave us the modern electric grid, we can't produce enough electricity. Like we basically uninvented the reliable electric grid. That is, that is an embarrassment. If we stay outraged, there's reason to think things could be improved. The decades of subsidies for wind and solar have taken their toll, but lawmakers like Bob Hall and Lois Colcourse believe things are turning around legislatively. So I think we're two to three years away from the reliable grid that I think we all envision we had. In November 2023, Texas voters approved a constitutional amendment creating the Texas Energy Fund. This $5 billion fund will make very low interest loans to investors seeking to build reliable plants, those things that are driven mainly by natural gas. This means policymakers and the public are recognizing that Texas needs a renewed focus on reliable energy. But as Bill Peacock told me, the money set aside for this program could have been spent lowering property taxes. So that's yet another casualty of years of tens of billions of dollars being spent to distort the energy market. Subsidies to fix the problem of subsidies. And Lois Colcourse told me the fund is also a consequence of years of political pressure from the left being applied to banks, pressuring them not to provide loans for reliable energy production. The big banks were saying, oh, no, we're not going to loan money to a dispatchable natural gas plant because it doesn't meet our ESG. For your listeners, ESG, environmental social governance, bad, B-A-D, bad. We have Newsom saying, hey, no more internal combustion engines. And then six days later saying, don't charge your EV. We don't have an ele enough electricity. And look at Texas. I mean, California, but look at Texas. How often are Texans being told, use less electricity? Like that's not the job of the electricity provider to tell you to use less. It's the job of them to give you as much as you want and need and can pay for. Just as we were finishing work on this documentary came news that Governor Greg Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick want a full review of all policies related to the Texas grid. Their concern was sparked by claims from ERCOT that in just six years, by 2030, Texas will need to have nearly double the energy capacity that we have today. We won't get there with unreliable energy production based on the hope that every day will feature sunny skies and perfect breezes. 
do we really want to follow California's example in that regard? For Texans to right ourselves, it will require that we return to our first principles. We must reject the politically driven climate hysteria that harms Texans and future generations. Instead, we must embrace a strong, vibrant adherence to the free market that will allow us, our children, and generations to come to thrive. I, I always come back to one thing, and I, I'm, I'm a fifth generation Texan. I love my state. I love my state. And I don't want to see it negatively impact by an industry that's hurting it or hurting the people of this state. Why should we have any doubt about the Texas grid? We're Texas. We're sitting on an ocean of God's blessings that we can use for economic prosperity and productivity. So what can we do about this? As it turns out, Sun Tzu offered some really good advice. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. As the battle wages for our energy independence, our economic future, and our national security, it's clear that we've been deceived by politicians seeking the applause of left-wing activists and corporations that put short-term profits over long-term prosperity for our citizenry. Radical anti-human environmentalists have overrun thoughtful conservationists. Subsidies have distorted the energy markets beyond recognition, and corporate greed has given a global superpower unprecedented access into the very heart of our economy. And through it all, China has stood ready to pounce. They've manipulated the deceitful politicians and played into the schemes of the handout-seeking corporate cronies. What will we do next, knowing that we've been lied to, knowing that we've been manipulated? For our nation and economy to be secure, we must secure our grid. We can't afford the insecurity of unreliable power. We can't continue to enrich those seeking to destroy our way of life. We can't subsidize those who want to destroy us. We know our enemy, and we have seen the schemes they're employing to destroy us. We know ourselves. We know our dreams. We know what's at stake. Now, we must save Texas.